Welcome to this very special edition of Word Alive. I'm John Carmichael and I'm standing here with our prayer partners. And today we are going to be showing you clips of previous conferences in which Perry Stone has done here at Evangel World Prayer Center, Billtown Road location. And a little later on in the program, we're going to give you an opportunity for you to be able to make these conferences a part of your faith library and show you how you're going to be able to receive over 15 hours worth of teaching from Perry Stone of past conferences and they're going to be a great blessing to your life and in addition to your faith library so we know you're going to enjoy these clips and then you're going to want to make sure that you get the best of Perry Stone Volume 3, and we'll show you how that you're going to be able to include these in your faith library. So don't go away. There's more when we come back. Provoked him to jealousy with a foreign gods, with abominations. They provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, not to God, to gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that their fathers did not fear. Of the rock who begot you, you are unmindful. You have forgotten the God who fathered you. And when the Lord saw it, he spurned them because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, I will hide my face from you. I will See what their end will be, for they are a perverse generation, a children in whom there is no faith. This is the word that just leaped out at me. Let me read it. A perverse, we would say today, perverted generation and children in whom there is no faith. One out of five people now have no church affiliation or religious affiliation in America and 30% of the young people in the universities, I mean, if you look at the statistics, we're becoming a nation without knowledge of God now, okay? They have provoked me to jealousy by that which is not God. Everybody say the word provoke. Provoked. The word provoked is an interesting word in Hebrew. It's found 64 times in the Old Testament. And the Hebrew word provoked means to scorn, to crack off in rage, to be indignant, to be bitter with complaint. And you, what it actually refers to here is God's become, God himself becoming angry and becoming upset because of the actions of his people, the idolatry, their personal sins, and their breaking of the Ten Commandments. Now, let me share with you what happens. The provocation or the provoking of God eventually leads to God speaking to a nation through selective judgment. If in the selective judgment the people do not listen, God then sends major judgment. If in major judgment they do not listen, God finally abandons them. That's what I'm going to show you in the next few moments in the scriptures that we're going to be dealing with. The word judgment in Hebrew is the word mishpat, and it means to pronounce a verdict, either good or bad, after weighing the evidence. Now please understand this. The judgment of God is never released just because God says, you know, those folks are upsetting me and I don't like what they're doing, so I'm going to let them have it. God weighs evidence. The Bible talks about a cup of iniquity becoming full and then God would judge the Amorites. And the cup of mystery Babylon is full with the blood of the martyrs. See, there's a cup. And slowly it fills up. God doesn't send judgment when it's filling up. He only sends it once it's filled up. And this is the reason why you see things as we're going to talk about happening the way they are today. The idea of judgment, the idea of, of, of God uh, weighing the legal evidence is found very clearly in Daniel chapter 5 verse 27. When uh, Belshazzar had the vessels of the house of God, in fact, he, he, had, he was drinking from the sacred vessels that, they, that his father Nebuchadnezzar had stolen from the city of Jerusalem when he destroyed the temple. And uh, as a matter of fact, the Bible said they had a candlelight and behind the candelabra came the writing of a man's hand. Some some Hebrew scholars believe that they actually brought out the temple menorah and they were actually having this drunken party and the temple menorah was lit and they were celebrating their victory over the Jews and all of their wealth they had when suddenly behind the menorah a man's finger began to write these words you are weighed in the balance and found wanting you are mishpat you have now been weighed and now you're wanting this is a very very interesting reference here that I want to tell you now in the in the Aramaic uh, which 
much. The part of Daniel, Daniel 5 was written in Aramaic, not Hebrew. In the Aramaic language, it says, you have been found to have a deficit. I've taken the account and the account don't add up. I've taken the account and now you're in the red and you know the expression they're in the black means it's good and the red means you have a deficit. He says, now you've got a great deficit and you're going to pay for your deficit. Now in this idea of God weighing a nation or weighing a people to determine if he does good for that nation or to determine if they are worthy of maybe say a selective judgment period there's some things you need to understand I talk about the levels of judgment the levels of judgment in the Bible are found with three different levels and this is very important that you grasp this three different levels number one you have a local judgment or one uh, what I call a regional judgment number two you can then have from regional judgment to a national judgment and from national judgment you can have a global judge judgment now Sodom is an example of a regional judgment there were five cities of the plain four were destroyed including Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19 and the small city of Go Zoar escaped the judgment then the city of Jerusalem Jerusalem was a was in Israel but when Jerusalem fell the entire nation of Israel fell in the time of the Babylonians and also in the time of the Roman destruction in 70 AD so it was not just one locality it affected everything around it now the greatest example of the entire world being judged was in the days of Noah in the flood of Noah where only eight souls escaped in the ark and the entire world was destroyed and affected by what was called a global flood so once again judgment comes either regionally to an area or it can come to an entire nation at once but in the tribulation will be the next time we read in the Bible when there'll be a global ju judgment that will be effective now here's the question when you talk about judgment we see God and this is when I was a kid I saw this he's sitting on a throne he's got a big cosmic baseball bat like a laser and he decides to point it to somebody and he zaps everybody come on like a Star Trek movie how many know what I'm talking about all the Trekkies out there now that is not what happens in judgment here's what happens in an act of judgment God uses the things which are on earth to impact the people and he does it in this manner I'm going to give you a couple ways number one it is clear from the Bible judgment is always linked to economic conditions judgment is always linked to economic crisis in other words not all economic crisis may be a judgment but there are times that a judgment can be seen in an economic crisis for example in the Bible when there was droughts and no irrigation they could not produce food that led to a famine when it led to a famine it led to the fact that there was food shortages and these were classified as judgments in the Old Testament time there were also times when invaders would invade the land and steal things from the Hebrew people and overtake their properties and foreigners would come in and overtake their properties and believe it or not in Leviticus this was also a sign of judgment where the people who'd been in the land for years no longer were able to sustain the land and they had to give up their land to other people who were coming in and taking over it from the outside so economically Jerusalem was the center of the economic section of the nation of Israel and so in the time of the Babylonians and the Romans the gold the silver all the precious stones the precious things that were in there were taken captive by invaders number two this is important you grasp this when God sends a judgment to a nation he is judging the idol gods of that nation why were there ten plagues in Egypt can I tell you why there were ten plagues because you can go and find that there were ten idol gods that the Egyptians served and every single plague there were supposed to be an Egyptian God that could stop that plague and do you know come on somebody that not one Egyptian God could stop any plague or undo any plague that Jehovah sent and you know who the last God was you ready I've always preached this in fact this is in the Perry Stone study Bible coming out in three years alrighty because I'm done I'm done with the book of Exodus but the tenth the eleventh play the eleventh judgment was Pharaoh at the Red Sea most people don't count that they just count the plagues in Egypt but remember they were at the edge of Egypt at the Red Sea why was that the eleventh judgment because the biggest God in Egypt was Pharaoh and Pharaoh could not stop what God did and he wanted to take the Hebrew babies and throw them in the water and God heard it and said that's how you're going to end you're going to end up drowning in the water 
Watch what you say about other people. In the, in the time of the Assyrians coming in, in Jerusalem, invading it, 185,000 men were killed. These 185,000 men were Assyrians who worshipped the idol of Ashtaroth and Bel, who should have been able to intervene on their behalf, but they did not. Then in Babylon, when the Babylonians were overthrown by the Medes and Persians, isn't it odd that Bel and Murdoch, Murdoch was one of the idol gods of Babylon. They had great temples built to Bel and Murdoch. None of the idol gods could deliver them. So in other words, when a judgment comes, it is a judgment against the idol of that nation. What is it that they're worshiping that is not the real God? What is it that they place their trust in? Now let me just stop and tell you that one of the things we're hearing now in America, and this just makes me uh, nauseous, is that all religions are a way to heaven. That it doesn't matter who you are and what you believe. And I heard a guy say this, all gods are equal. <laughs> well, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. let me do a little bit of Tennessee hillbilly preaching right here, okay? <laughs> If all gods are equal, I want somebody to explain to me how Daniel escaped the lion's den, but when they threw the Babylonians in, the lions ended up eating them. What happened to that God that was supposed to protect the Babylonians? I'd like to know if all gods are equal, why three Hebrew boys had to go into a fiery furnace, but they escaped without even the smell of smoke. But when they threw the men into the fire, the men that threw them into the fire got consumed by the heat of the furnace, which was seven times hotter. They all died and melted, but the three Hebrew boys come out. If all gods are equal how come the Babylonian God didn't show up and give those guys some kind of a fire protection when they threw the Hebrew boys in the fire if all gods are equal if all gods are equal I want somebody to tell me how the Egyptian magicians could throw their rods down and they could become a snake that's pretty powerful but somebody tell me if all gods are equal how come the rod of Aaron swallowed up the rods of the Egyptians if all gods are equal if all gods are equal I want somebody to tell me why didn't Pharaoh have a God he was a God he, he was worshipped as a god but why didn't Pharaoh have a god power in him that when the death angel came by his house he could spare his own child from death the Bible said Pharaoh's son died when the death angel came by but there wasn't one son of the Hebrew children that died the night the destroyer went through the house because the blood of the lamb was on the doorpost if all gods are equal I want somebody to tell me if all gods are equal how come when the ark of the covenant was sitting beside Dagon Dagon Dagon's head fell off, then Dagon's waist fell off, and the Ark of the Covenant is sitting there, and they finally got the Ark of the Covenant out of the temple of Dagon, because there wasn't going to be nothing left of the idol when the presence of God on the Ark of the Covenant, if all gods are equal, how come Dagon couldn't stand in the presence of a gold box called the Ark of the Covenant? If all gods are equal, somebody tell me why that 850 false prophets of Baal could not call the fire down on Mount Carmel. They, they start cutting themselves. They hoop. They hollered. They ran. They jumped. Nothing happened. Not even smoke showed up. But when the man of God who knew Yahweh Jehovah prayed a 63 word prayer, the fire fell. I've come by to tell you on my way to heaven, not all gods are equal. Not all religions are the same. There is only one God that can watching a special edition Word Alive in which we're showing excerpts of previous conferences in which Perry Stone is done here at Evangel World Prayer Center, our Billtown Road location. And today we want to give you an opportunity to make these a part of your faith library by presenting to you the best of Perry Stone Volume 3. It's going to be available for you now up until conference time. Once the conference comes, you will not be able to purchase this anywhere else. This five DVD set includes messages like 666 and the Scarlet Harlot, or Israel between Barak and a hard place, or how about provoking God from Pennsylvania Avenue and more are included here for just $35. You can call today and receive this five DVD set. But if you call today, that information at the bottom of your screen, we are going to include a sixth DVD that will be when Satan is your friend. 
Friend, I'm going to tell you, that message is absolutely going to be revelation to your life. It actually is going to encourage your faith. You're going to want to make sure that you get this six DVDs. Five DVDs plus if you call today, you get a sixth bonus DVD as a part of your faith library for just $35. And if you call today, we are going to be able to ship this to you absolutely free. $35 free shipping over 15 hours of the best of Perry Stone. Friend, seize this opportunity and make this a part of your faith library. But we also want to, to look at our partners and give you an opportunity to help us here in the ministry. And for a gift of $50, we want to include the Best of Perry Stone Volume 3, including the bonus DVD, but also today, Pastor Bob's best-selling book, 100 Days of Unbroken Prayer. Of all the books that Pastor Bob has written, I have heard numerous comments of how this has changed people's lives and their prayer life and encouraged them, but also we are including two prayer patterns. One prayer pattern healing prayer for cancer, and the second prayer pattern, the Pentecostal prayer, your day of miracles. These prayer, part, prayer patterns can be yours. Also, for a gift of $50, we are also going to include the King's Oil, Holy Anointing Oil, according to Exodus chapter 30. So here you have the Best of Perry Stone, volume 3. Pastor Bob's best-selling book, 100 Days of Unbroken Prayer. Two prayer patterns that will assist you in your prayer life and a bottle of oil, anointing oil, that you can use to anoint yourself, anoint your family. All of this for a gift of $50 to the ministry. The proceeds of this is going to Holy Land Broadcasting that right now is ministering to people in Israel and the surrounding areas there. We have boots on the ground right now ministering to people. Just opened up a call center in which many are calling in, receiving the Lord Jesus, being healed in their body. Miracles and testimonies are coming in. And you can be a part of what God is doing there in the Holy Land with a gift of $50. You can get the best of Perry Stone Volume 3. Pastor Bob's best-selling book, two prayer patterns, and a bottle of holy anointing oil that you can use to believe God for miracles in your life in Jesus' name. Call today. Get yours now before it's too late. Once conference starts, this, this offer will not be uh, available to you. So now's the time. Seize the day. Right now we're going to go back into one of the other messages where Perry Stone had come to our Billtown Road location and we know that this is being a blessing to you in Jesus' name. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Whew. Now having said this about escape, let me say something. Someone said, well, I just don't think there is any escape. Well, you haven't read the book of Revelation. There's three escapes in the book of Revelation. The first group is the 144,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel that are on earth in chapter 7 and in heaven around, woohoo, come on, in the temple of God in heaven in Revelation chapter 14, sealed with the seal of God. The second group is Revelation chapter 12, a Jewish remnant group that flees out of Israel and goes to Petra where they are supernaturally protected for 42 months to escape the Antichrist. And Jesus comes back to Bozrah in Isaiah chapter 63 to rescue that remnant in Petra. Not a one of them is killed. Number three, the third Jewish group is a remnant that will be according to Zechariah 13, 8 through 9 in the city, in the area of Judea and the city of Jerusalem that will come through the fire protected from the Antichrist himself. So there's an escape of 144,000. There's an escape of a remnant to Petra living in the wilderness. There is thirdly an escape of those from Judah and in the area of Jerusalem. Now let me give a verse to you. Oh, look at, your son, look at somebody and say, are you in the remnant? Come on, say it. Are you in the remnant? Okay, we're going to go somewhere for just a moment. Watch this. Revelation chapter 7, 1 through 3. After these things, I saw the four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, 
And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to, to harm the earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. And this is that Jewish remnant from uh, uh, 12,000 from the, all tribes except Dan that are sealed with a seal. And listen, here's the thing. The Antichrist can't even touch them. The judgments don't even touch them because they have a seal. Now I'm going to ask you a question. If God would take 144,000 Jews from the 12 tribes of Israel who have kept his commandments, who have not defiled themselves, the Bible said, then what, how in the world can you tell me he'll protect 144,000 Jews with a seal, not let the Antichrist touch him, not let a judgment harm him, and yet he's going to take his bride and cut our heads off? You tell me how that's possible. That's not even logical when you read Scripture about how God separates wheat from terror, good and bad, good sheep, sheep from goat, bad fish from good fish. Come on and preach. I'm going to. Now, for a moment, I want to talk about something called the seal of God. This is the last part of the message. I want everybody to hang with me here because we're going to do something in just a minute in prayer. But the seal of God. The seal of God has always been something that has been very, very fascinating to me. So I began to study what does a Jew believe the seal of God is. Ready? Anybody want to hear this? Say yes. yes. <clears throat> it's, it's one word in English, truth. Truth. But let me give it to you in Hebrew, emet. Just write it down, E-M-E-T, emet. Emet in Hebrew is truth. When you say emet, now, here's what's interesting about the Hebrew word truth. It has three letters, all right? The first letter in English is an E, emet, but it's actually an aleph, all right? So you have an aleph, then you have a mim, and then you have the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, tav. Aleph, mim, tav is aleph, which is, amet, which is truth. Here's what's cool about that. To make up that word, you have the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, you have the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and you have the very middle letter of the Hebrew alphabet, meaning it's a scale. And truth is always balanced. Real truth is not weird. Come on, real truth don't turn you into a nut. Real truth will always have a great balance to it. Now, it's interesting <laughs> that Aleph, who preach? is the first letter, Tav is the last letter, and in Greek you would say it this way, Alpha and Omega. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and Omega, but that was written in Greek. In the Hebrew Bible, it's just, it's the way it is. I am the Aleph and I am the Tav. He is the first and the last letter of truth. But the Mim, Mim in the middle is the first letter of the name Mashiach which is Messiah. So Jesus is always in the center of all truth. If you take Aleph Mem Tav and you take the Aleph out because when you, the, the, the letter Aleph can represent, it's one of the Several letters of the Hebrew alphabet that when you see it can represent God's name, okay? If you take the Aleph and live the word Met, you know what Met means in Hebrew? Death. Met, M-E-T, death. When you add God to the situation of death, you're going to have truth. Where you have truth, you have life. If you take God out of your situation, you're going to have death. But wait a minute, that's not all. Emet comes out of a Hebrew verb, amen. Or we say in English, amen. Amen or amen actually means to make it firm. We say in English it means so be it, but it means to make something solid or make something firm. The picture is, in Hebrew school, they say the picture of amen, or amen, is a mother picking up an infant who can't stand up on its own. 
So she holds the infant up in order to make it firm so that it can properly walk. So when I preach, mm -hmm, and you say, Amen, you're saying make it firm so I can walk. Hey! When I preach something, when a song is sung and you say, Woo, Amen, you're saying I just got it in my spirit. It's going to make me firm. It's going to help me walk. But Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. So, when these 144,000 are sealed with the seal of God, they are sealed with a seal of truth. Now, let's, let's look at something else here. Ready? In the New Testament, in the New Testament, mm -hmm, gee, there's a verse that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one both which are things which are in heaven, which are on earth, even unto him. That's the catching away. In him, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, who was first trusted in Christ and should be to the praise of his glory. In, watch it now. In him you also trusted that after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed... In what? Truth. Truth, is, truth in Hebrew is what? Emet. What is it? Seal of God. It's what they've been teaching for centuries. That after you believe the truth, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory? In Hebrew, the Holy Spirit can be called Ruach Ha Emet which is the spirit of truth. Now you're a believer. He says when you come into a redemptive covenant with Jesus and you believe in him and you have received the truth, guess who you met the very first person before you ever met Jesus? May I tell you that no man can come to the Father except he's drawn. And the drawing is the Holy Spirit according to your scripture. You met the spirit of truth when you heard preaching and you met the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit's the one that said, you better listen, you better listen, pay attention, pay attention. You better believe what that man or woman's saying, pay attention. And you believed it by being the quickening of the Holy Spirit. Now, according to the Word of God, there is a seal of the Holy Spirit that is placed upon a person who abides in truth. I said abides. According to the script, let me, just, let me just give you something real quick. I shouldn't even get off on this because I'm working on a message now and I'm going to tear the whole thing up right here in two minutes. But a lot of people think that once you get saved, I read an article today where a guy said, once I'm saved, if I sin now or in, for the rest of my life, I'm just as saved as I always was. Let me, and, and, and that's, very, I call that sloppy agape. <laughs> but when I grew up, on the other hand, there was a group of people that always taught us that if you thought one thing wrong, you're backslid. If you said a cuss word, you're backslid. If you thought a dirty thought, you're backslid. You might as well go, for, you know. And so we had a backsliding mentality. Anybody raised that way? Backsliding, boy, I'm telling you, you're going to hell because you got your hair over your ears. I heard all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Condemnation. That's the other extreme. In John's Gospel where it says, He that believeth on the Son hath life. I have a book in Greek. In fact, it's in my room. Don't even ask me to get it. I ain't going to let you look at it. It's heavy revelation. I'm going to keep it myself. <laughs> it's a Greek scholar. Knows Greek up one and down the other. He says, when it comes to your salvation, making it to the end is based on abiding because when it says that about the truth, about Jesus and about the truth, about knowing the truth and knowing Him, it is a Greek tense that means to continually abide in. It doesn't mean a one-time knowledge. Most churches are preaching it that once you get a one-time knowledge of Jesus, everything is great. Let me tell you, that's the start. But in the Greek, in the word of knowing him, it is a Greek word. Greek has tenses. It has neuters, singular, plural, etc. But in that scripture, if you'll check it out, it is a tense of continuing to know, continuing to abide. Because i got news for you. If you're really saved, you want to abide. You won't be making excuses for all the craziness going on. Now, here's what's cool. 
The Holy Spirit is the earnestness of our inheritance. The Greek word is aharabon, aharabon. And what does that word mean? It is, quote, a pledge, earnest money, or a down payment for the possession of something which has been purchased. In modern Greek, the Greek word aharabona means an engagement ring. Woo! You missed a good place to whoo! So, let me just, let me, let me kind of bring this around real quick. As a believer who has a redemptive covenant, who believes this book, who seeks after truth, the seal that God has given you is the seal of the Holy Spirit, which becomes the engagement ring telling you he's coming back. He's going to pick me up out of this place. He's going to take me to his city. And we're going to have a marriage supper. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to inherit the new Jerusalem with a place to live. And I'm coming back with my king to rule and reign with him for 1,000 years. Come on, somebody, get that in your spirit. Here we go. Here we go now. Ready? In ancient documents, it was not legal till it was sealed. What's that mean? That means when Jesus tells me as a believer that I have authority over the enemy, he's put a seal in me to make it legal that I have authority over the enemy. When Jesus says that we can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, it means that the Holy Spirit put the seal in me to say, Satan, when these believers lay hands on them, you got to back up because I have now sealed them with the seal that gives them legal authority over all of the power. I'm going to tell you, I'm about to do a flip in this church right now. If somebody don't help me, praise God, and get the revelation I'm telling you. We are legal to have authority in the earth because of the Holy Spirit. Wow, that was a powerful message. What you're watching today is excerpts of the best of Perry Stone, Volume 3, that we want to make available to you today for just a gift of $35. This five DVD set, it would be a powerful addition to your faith library. But if you call today, we're going to include a sixth DVD plus free shipping all for $35. But we have a second offer today for friends of our ministry. For $50, we want to allow you to have the six DVDs, The Best of Perry Stone, Volume 3, plus Pastor Bob Rogers' best-selling book, 100 Days of Unbroken Prayer, two prayer patterns, plus a bottle of holy anointing oil, for the gift of $50, we want to be able to sow this into your life. And you are going to be sowing into Holy Land Broadcasting that right now has boots on the ground there ministering to people. We just opened up a call center. Hundreds are calling in right now receiving ministry. And you can be a part of that for just $50 today. I encourage you to call right now because once the conference begins, this offer will not be available. In fact, it's all, this offer is available nowhere around the world. But you have an opportunity today to make this a part of your life. The conference is coming up and we are so excited and we want you to go ahead, mark your calendars, clear your schedule. June 20th through the 23rd. That's Thursday through Sunday. Perry Stone's going to be here at Evangel World Prayer Center, Billtown Road location. You're going to want to make sure that you are a part of this great conference that's coming to this area. Don't miss out on what God is doing. And once the conference starts, this offer that we're presenting to you will not be available. Right now, our operators are busy, standing by, waiting for you. We do have limited quantities, so don't wait. As soon as you find out about this, get on that phone, call our operators. We'll be able to take your information, and we will rush this to your house so that it can be a blessing for you. Again, $35.00. Five DVD set plus if you call today a six DVD free shipping for fifty dollars will include Pastor Bob's book, two prayer patterns, plus holy anointing oil. Seize the day. Right now we're gonna go back into another powerful teaching by Brother Perry Stone at Evangel World Prayer Center, Bill Town.
offer is available today. It won't be available once the conference begins with Perry Stone. So seize the day and make this a part of your life in the name of the Lord. Right now we're going to go back into one of the excerpts that is found here in the Best of Perry Stone Volume 3. I know it's been an enjoyable day in your life as you've been receiving ministry today. And we're going to get right back into the message. God bless you. I think of individuals when I see, I've got to say this from my heart. Sometimes through Nickelodeon, sometimes through Disney, they have contests or they have these young talents and they find that most of them are girls. Molly Cyrus was one. And they bring them in and they say, look, let's make her look wholesome. Let's make her look family oriented. And by the way, Molly did have, I preached at her granddad's church in Flatwoods, Kentucky when I was 17 years old. I don't know that her daddy wasn't in the service back then. We had a baptismal service in February. It broke ice in a lake. Never done it before and have never done it since. <laughs> Only in Flatwoods, Kentucky will you do that in the month of February. Hallelujah. <laughs> little, little independent church I preached at. Anyway, what happens is this. And it's, it, Pam and I have talked about this ever since we've been married. The world will take an extremely talented man or boy, or let me go back, a boy or a young girl, and groom them and put them on a program, show them to the entire world. But see, as they get to be 14 and 15, they can no longer appeal to that kid's audience, that kind of pure, simple kid's audience, so they, now they have to remake them. So they put them in a miniskirt, Throw makeup all over their face. You understand where I'm coming from? Then they got to sing some really carnal song while they're shaking their body all over the place to get another record and to draw in another group. And see, what really is so bad is this. There is so much seduction in the world system. And what happens to so many people is when they hit 30 to 40 and they've been doing that all their life, they have a void that was never filled in their life spiritually. I want you to think about the number of people in music who died of drug overdoses. I want you to think of the number of people. Now, let me explain something to you that I think I was in Tampa, Florida, and this came up. You know, there were some professional athletes there. In fact, I'll not name him. I was preaching, and one of the greatest baseball players that had four rings. He had four rings of World Series. He's sitting on the front row. And the Holy Spirit, he came back. I mean, this guy is about as tall as this. And when he came back, I had a word of knowledge for him. I said, the Spirit of God said tonight to tell you that you are bored with your life. And the reason you keep going to drugs and you turn to alcohol is because back when you could play sports and you were the king. You see, I talk blunt to people. I'm not, I, don't, I didn't say mean. I don't talk mean. But I give them what the Holy Spirit says. I said, back in that day, you were the man and your adrenaline flowed all the time. Now you have to sit at home and your adrenaline's not throwing. All those chemicals that make you feel good don't flow anymore. You don't have an adrenaline thrill of running out on the field. And what you've done is you've turned to alcohol and drugs to try to get a feel-good feeling that can only come through the Holy Ghost. Amen. And I just reached up there and laid my hands on his head and began to pray and he began to cry and the power of God began to move. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, now, whew, boy, I feel there's something going on. My Lord have mercy. See, what happens is this. I think, let me tell you who I feel very sorry for. I mean this, and I'm going to, I'm going to give you my personal opinion and you may totally disagree, but Michael Jackson, let me tell you why I felt sorry for Michael Jackson. He could sing when he was a little lad, the Jackson Five. All right, I grew up around him, not around him physically, but hearing him sing. Michael became so famous that he could not go out in public anywhere without being mobbed by people, screaming, trying to pull his clothes off, trying to get a button off of him for a souvenir to sell it on eBay, Want, pushing pictures, wanting his autograph. And how sad it was. You know, let, me, let me tell you about him. Let me tell you about him from people who knew him personally. And I said this, I may start crying because it really does. 
He was a young man in his late 40s, died when he was about 50, who never had a chance to be a kid. They forced him as a kid to act like an adult, to work as hard as an adult, and he never, you read, his, you, you read people that talk about it, how they worked him, he never, and all the air, he goes as a man and builds a fantasy land on his property, and they're all making fun of him for doing it, and I'm not making fun, I'm almost in tears thinking, there's a young man who wants to go back and be a kid that he was never able to be. When he would have, you know why he would often have younger kids come into his house? Because he didn't trust adults. Adults were always wanting money from him, pulling something from him. He would go to a theme park and give them a, about a million dollars and say, shut the park down and let me in just a few. What a, and I mean this sincerely, what a terrible life to have to live. And I do not believe, I'm telling you the truth from inside information that I know because there was a confession made later by the young man that said he lied. I don't believe he ever molested a child. I don't believe it was in him to do it. I believe he just loved kids because he didn't have anybody else that loved him. He loved kids because kids hung around him. And at 50 years of age, the genius, you just saw him sing. Let me tell you, he was a musical genius. And a musical genius died at age 50 alone. Because here's what will happen. The enemy will take our most gifted. Do you understand that in rock and roll music, Elvis Presley was raised in the Assemblies of God, a Pentecostal church. Jerry Lee Lewis was raised in the Assembly of God, a Pentecostal church. Mickey Gilly was raised in the Assembly of God, a Pentecostal church. All, Chuck Berry, all the black singers that started rock and roll, most of them were raised in a Baptist church. Everybody who started in rock and roll got their singing career in a church. Whitney Houston, it was a church. I could go on and on and name them. What happens is this. Put yourself on guard for your children who are gifted. Come on, church, help me here. Because the enemy will bring someone into their life, and they'll say, hey, man, you got talent. We'll take you to the top. But you got to do it our way. Thank God I had a friend one time that could sing as good as anybody in the United States and they kept off from this girl country uh, music things and rock and roll things and she just said, I can't do that because the Lord won't let me sing that kind of music. Well, you're not going to go very far. I told you it's not about being popular. It's about being obedient to God. And I'd rather stand before God and know that I lost half of my TV audience by preaching the truth than for me to go up there and say, Perry, you had a following of people, but you never told him anything. Nobody ever got saved and nobody ever got right with God. Now, here's what happened to Judas. Judas is a disciple of Jesus. Judas, Judas has been chosen by Christ. Judas traded his soul for some bread. Money. Money. A meta, a, a bread is a metaphor for money. 30 pieces of silver to give up Christ. He then aligned himself with the leaders of the inner circle at the temple to betray Christ. Watch this. He ended up committing suicide. Now, in case you didn't know it, I just showed you the three things of the three temptations Jesus went through and how Satan fell, caused Judas to fall into the three. Come on, Judas. Money. Come on. Give me Jesus, I'll give you some bread. Commit suicide, Jesus. Go ahead and, come on, come on, Judas. Jump from the hill with the rope on your neck. Go ahead and jump, Judas. Now let's do something else. There are some things the enemy can do. But there are some things the enemy cannot do. But the problem is, he cannot do what he's telling you to do. Say that again, Brother Stone. The enemy cannot do what he's telling you to do. He says to Jesus, now you're going to have to follow me real carefully here. He says to Jesus, command the stones to be made into bread. But Satan cannot mm -hmm, take bread. I'm reversing you now, pay attention. Satan cannot take bread and turn it into stones. Well, what are you talking about now? You've lost me. Well, let me just explain it to you this way. 
The Egyptian magicians in the time of Aaron and Moses all stood before Pharaoh with the two prophets. And when Aaron, when, the, mm -hmm, when Aaron threw his rod down, the rod that was a stick became a snake. In other words, the stone became bread. Something happened miraculously. Something solid became something living. The Egyptian magicians had two rods. They, Janez and Jambres is their name. They threw their down and their sticks also turned into something of life which was a slithering snake but wait a minute Satan cannot take bread and turn it into stone so what happened was the serpent of Aaron went over there and acted like a vacuum cleaner and swallowed up the two snakes of Janez and Jambres and then when Aaron's rod became a snake became a rod again inside of his rod was the two rods of the Egyptian magicians that had just been swallowed. You say, I'm still not getting what you're saying. Well, let me try to say it to you this way, and let me just say it this way. And when Moses began to perform the miracles, the Egyptian magicians three times could imitate the miracles that Moses was doing. However, on miracle number four, they finally said, miracle four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. We cannot duplicate what they're doing anymore, but neither can we undo what their God does. In other words, we might make some flies, but we can't make flies go away. We can make some lice, but we can't make lice go away. We might be able to bloody bring some frogs, and they did, but we can't make the frogs go away. So in other words, the devil is telling you to make stones into bread, but he cannot even take bread and make it into stones. What are you saying? Let me make it plain. When the in mm -hmm. It simply means that the devil can not undo what God does for you. I got saved. He cannot undo my salvation. I'm baptized in the Holy Ghost. He can't stop me from speaking in tongues. When God wants to heal my body, he's up against it. He cannot keep disease and sickness on me when God gets ready to heal my body. The devil cannot undo what God does for you. He that the sun sets free is free indeed. That's where the shout goes right there. Let me give you another one. Jesus said, I am the bread come down from heaven. Jesus said, you are lively stones. Peter made that statement. So Jesus is bread and we're stones when we become redeemed. So Jesus would never take stones in a desert and turn them into bread to fulfill the desire of the devil. But he went ahead and took some people because he's the bread. And when, the, when, the, when we got to eating the bread, we became stones. So Jesus turned stones into bread. And Jesus can take bread and turn them into... Y'all will get this in a minute. I'm talking about a little metaphor, a little allegory here. Number two. There are some things the enemy cannot do. He's telling you to do. He's, tell, he's telling Jesus, jump. He's tell, I'm telling you, I keep feeling this. He's telling somebody here, your life's not worth it. Give up and quit. But here's something you need to know. Ready? He can't make you jump if you don't want to jump. <laughs> I, 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 I gotta say it again. He, the enemy, cannot make you jump when you don't want to jump. Well, the devil made me do it. Well, the devil told me to do it. Well, the devil forced me to do it. No, he didn't. It's not the devil, it's you. Because if he tells you to jump from the pinnacle, the temple, you're the one that has to determine whether or not you're going to jump. So this is what I'm trying to say to you. Quit giving the enemy so much credit in your situation. 
Well, the devil gave me a flat tire on the way to church. No, he didn't. You ran over a nail. Well, the devil caused my engine to go out. My God, no, he didn't. You forgot to put oil in the engine for the past three weeks. Oh, my God, the devil made me run out of gas. No, you didn't. You're like my wife. She runs it down to empty. I'm telling you, that's the only thing me and her fuss about. We get along 100%. 99% of the time, we're like two angels in love. But every time she pulls up in that car on a trip, I look at the gas gauge and it's on red. I said, woman, don't you understand that when it gets down to a fourth of a tank, you're supposed to pull in the dumb gas station and get gas. Would you men help me out here? That is a woman thing. Oh, he does it too. She said to me one day, she said, you're so crazy, you come down to half a tank and you top it off. I said, woman, let me tell you a story. <laughs> I went to Bulgaria, to, she knew it. I went to Bulgaria to preach years ago when the Russians shut off all fuel to Bulgaria and there was no fuel in the country. And I was on top of a snow-capped mountain in a diesel van with the underground bishop of the underground church who took us up to eat after preaching a big crusade in the big, big auditorium with 10,000 people. But what the bishop did not tell us is he forgot to put the fuel can in the back of the van. And as we're coming off of a snow-capped mountain back to Sofia, Bulgaria, a diesel vehicle ran out of gas. There was no brakes going down the mountain. He took a handbrake and started doing this. It started smoking, and I started seeing them take a helicopter and get my carcass out of off of a mountain and take me back to the United States in a coffin. And I, I started laughing a little bit, and Floyd Lahan, I don't know if you know Lahan, Lahan, he said, you better pay Perry, pray, Perry, pray, my God, this is serious. And we got to praying, and I realized how serious it was, and there was no fuel in the nation. I knew there was no fuel. I had to fly out in an airplane. I didn't know how I was going to get back to the airport. And I said, oh God, and all of a sudden it hit me. Jesus took two loaves and a few fish, and he created a multitude. He multiplied from nothing. I said, Jesus, if you can take two loaves and a fish and multiply and give a guy 12 basket loads, I'm not asking for fuel because I don't have money to pay for it. I got money to pay for it. I'm asking for fuel because there ain't no fuel. The money don't matter. Put some fuel in this thing so my wife won't have to send a helicopter and take my carcass off that canyon on the left side of this road. And the overseer hit the dashboard. And when he hit the dashboard, the gas tank moved up and he started the car. Oh, yes, it did. Started that van. Started the van. We went 20 miles on, on fumes and got right to his house and it died. Went back on the inside of the vehicle and he had enough fuel to put it back in and get us to church at the airport. I said, all right, woman, I've been in a situation where there was no gas. I'm your husband. I'm your head. You start filling up that tank when I... You are watching excerpts of the best of Perry Stone, Volume 3, that we want to make available to you today for just a gift of $35, five DVDs and messages including 666 and the Scarlet Harlot, or Israel between Barack and a Hard Place, or how about Provoking God from Pennsylvania Avenue and more. Now, I know there may be some watching that you've ordered Volume 1 or Volume 2, but friends, what's here in Volume 3 has not been available, made available to you in any other way, and today we are making these available to you. And if you call today, we will include a sixth DVD called When Satan is Your Friend, and we will waive all shipping costs to send to you now for $35. If you order today, you're going to get not five, but six DVDs. Over 15 hours of the best of Perry Stone conferences here at Evangel World Prayer Center. And we want to make these available to you right now for just a gift of $35. You will get this whole package. And including another offer that we have today is for $50. You can get the Best of Perry Stone Volume 3. You won't get that anywhere else. These are messages that are available only to you today. Plus, you're going to receive a book. Pastor Bob's best-selling book, 100 Days of Unbroken Prayer. You're going to receive two powerful 
prayer patterns that you can use in your own life that can help your prayer life go to another level as well as we are going to be sh shipping to you a bottle of holy anointing oil and rushing this to you so that you can be able to anoint yourself and use this to release your faith in the name of Jesus. Now when the conference begins June 20th through the 23rd, this offer will not be available. So today is the day to call right now and we have limited quantities so you want to make sure that you call in so you and your family can get this as a part of your life and you know it would be a good idea to watch all of these before the conference so now you're primed up and ready to go and when that conference begins June 20th through the 23rd you're going to make sure that you are ready. Now we have just a few moments left in the program and if you're calling today or getting ready to call we have asked our prayer partners to stand by and to stay over so that we can receive your call because we know this is going to be a blessing in your life and you're going to want to get this as a part of your faith library. Two offers today. For $35, you'll get the best of Perry Stone Volume 3 messages that you will not have be able to get anywhere else. If you call today, we'll include a sixth DVD. Free shipping on the whole package, but for the friends of our ministry, you can support Holy Land Broadcasting for $50. You'll get the C DVD set for Perry Stone, Pastor Bob's book, two prayer patterns, a bottle of holy anointing oil, all for just $50, sowing into the ministry, and it'll be a great blessing to you while you are blessing others in the name of the Lord. God bless you, and thank you for watching this special edition of Word Alive. Word Alive is a production of Bob Rogers Ministries in Louisville, Kentucky. For more information on the outreach of this ministry or to become a partner, visit bobrogersministries.org. And remember to like us on Facebook and Ustream. Just search TV Word Alive.